Hello, hello. Okay, Mikolai tells me I'm already two minutes late, so uh, I guess we'll start while everybody's rolling in here. Uh, my name is Alex Kogan. I'm um, American, as you can probably tell, but uh, I've been a software developer for, oh, I don't know, 25 years or something like that. And I've done a lot of different things, but the last four or five years I've concentrated pretty much on teaching people how to do Agile, a lot of automated testing, um, both teaching people how to do it and showing them how to do it and training them to do it and doing it. Um, as most of you probably know, it requires a lot of work both on building tests and teaching people how to use um, continuous integration tools and also a lot of work on building infrastructure to run automated tests. Um, when you do that, you generally build a lot of infrastructure so that you can run lots and lots of tests in parallel. And that's pretty much what we're talking about here today. Uh, the Selenium grid is probably something most of you are familiar with. It allows you to run Selenium browser tests um, easily with a managed, instead of having to launch your own browsers, it's just a, a resource that's out there. You can connect to it. You can request the different resources you want in terms of what browser, what version, what operating system, and it'll give you what you need and you can run with it. So. Um, I've worked for quite a few large organizations who do a lot of automated testing with browsers and we basically build a very large grid that people can just connect to and run tests and then they don't have to worry about it. But of course that's not all that easy. So uh, I think we're already here. Um, so today we're going to talk about building a Selenium grid with infrastructure as a service, so IaaS. Uh, I think it said PAAS on the thing, but it's all the same thing. Uh, so it's basically using Docker to dynamically build a grid as you need it, and then you can tear it up and take it down. Um, how many people here are familiar with Docker? Okay, less than I would expect. <laughs> that guy, all right, he's late. Um, so Docker's kind of the cool new thing that everybody thinks is so hyped, and the the thing with Docker is it's not really all that exciting because if you use Docker correctly, all you do is run your applications, the same as you did before. <laughs> so when you use Docker, you just see your applications running. But it's a really easy way of creating um, reusable containers that can be tested and then you can deploy the exact same container and you know what that you know that what you're deploying is what you've tested. Yeah? Um, so what is test automation and why do we need it? Um, so continuous delivery can't exist without test automation. So I, everybody who here knows what continuous delivery is? Okay, about the same. So, uh, I mean, there's continuous integration. We have, back in the old days, people started building automated tests because they were tired of doing testing manually. And then they started using continuous integration, which is really great because basically as you're writing code and checking it in, your continuous integration server is checking your code out and testing it constantly for you. And uh, I think continuous integration is probably, in my experience, one of the most uh, advantageous um, agile methodologies because uh, you know, I spent a lot of time writing code and when you find a bug in your code, it can take you a week or two to actually figure out where the bug is, stepping through the code with the debugger. And then once you figure out where it is, it takes you about three minutes to actually fix it. So if you're using continuous integration, every time you check in your code, assuming that your check-ins are small, then you know between here and here in this check-in I broke it and you don't have to look too hard for where you broke your code. Uh, continuous delivery is the idea that basically you can take your continuous integration if you know your test. As part of continuous integration, you have automated testing and you also have automated uh, delivery of your software because you're building your software, you're deploying it, and then you're testing it. So they said, well, wait a minute, we can deploy our software automatically. Why don't we deploy it into production automatically? And so that's continuous delivery. And then everybody says, oh, well, if I have a new idea, I can put it into my software and I can be using it tomorrow. Well, that says, great, so sign me up. I want continuous delivery. So I go into a lot of big companies and they say, we want continuous delivery, please turn it on for us. And I say, well, you don't seem to understand that if you want to have continuous delivery, you have to test your software well enough that you can actually deliver it. 
and you need to spend maybe two years writing automated tests before you can have continuous delivery. So people seem to think there's some magic switch they can turn on and they have it. And uh, the reality is that you have to invest an enormous amount of time building tests, as most people sitting here probably know. Um, the other reality is that if you're doing this kind of work, an enormous amount of the time you spend is building tests and seeing why your tests fail and if you have to improve your tests and things like that. So, uh, Web test automation is done by writing a program which literally opens a web browser and then uses the web browser as you would. Um, and that was what Selenium is. So how do we get web up test automation? Uh, you have to build tests. So a lot of people want to try to use these tools that you don't write any code and you can build automated tests. Um, as this guy said from a conference I went to a few months ago, he said, test automation involves development. If somebody else tells you otherwise, they're trying to sell you something. <laughs> so uh, in the reality, at the end of the day, if you really want to do sophisticated um, Test automation, you're probably writing code. You can, there are a lot of tools which will write a lot of code for you, and then you can maintain that code. That might be faster and easier. I personally, I just use the browser and uh, find the XPaths or CSS selectors myself because then I have a bit more control over what's going on. Um, so, to implement web automation test, you need to build a lot of tests. Yeah. You can write them a lot of languages. I usually use Java. I'm not going to get into any religious discussions. <laughs> and then you run your tests uh, using Jenkins or... There's plenty of other things. I'm kind of... Once I have something that works, I continue to use it. So I used Hudson and now I use Jenkins. But a lot of times people have Bamboo because it's they just buy the whole stack from Atlassian with Jira. Um, and there's, there's things that came out before Jenkins and anyways. Um, so here we're talk here to talk about web test automation infrastructure. So generally when you're running your automated tests, you have a, your Jenkins executor up top, which is, you have a whole lot of them running in parallel, yeah? And each of them is running a Selenium test. The Selenium test then connects to the hub, says I would like Firefox running on Mac OS X or whatever. And the hub says okay, that's node two, and it sends it there, or node three, sorry. <laughs> and then that connects, the browser on the node connects to the system under test. And today we're here to talk about this part in the middle, which looks like the biggest part, but of course it's the least complicated part. It's just a bunch of static software that sits there. Uh, the Jenkins executor is actually running the automated tests that you wrote, and your system under test is the code you're actually testing. So IAAS, what is it? Whoops. Ah, it's infrastructure as a service, yeah. And here, what kind of infrastructure are we talking about? Uh, On-demand scalable test execution infrastructure. So I have my grid. It's got two nodes on it. That's great. I run one test. Yeah, one of my nodes is being used. I run another test. Another one of my nodes is being used. And now I want to run another test. Uh-oh. Well, I can wait until these are done, or I can deploy some more. So let me bring up a couple more, like my graphics. Um, and then I can run two more tests. And Docker. What is Docker, and how does it make our life easy? Um, Docker is a really simple way of running software. Somebody produces a Docker image for you, and they put it up on the Docker registry, and you just say, I want to run this piece of software, and your computer looks and it sees if, you're, if it's there. If it's not, it downloads it for you, and then it runs it. So here um, we are running a whole bunch of Firefox nodes, and I just tell Docker that I want to run Selenium slash node Firefox, and it goes to the Docker registry. It downloads that um, and runs it for me. So launching uh, Firefox and Chrome's nodes on Linux using Docker is really, really easy. You just tell Docker what kind of node you want, either Chrome or Firefox. You also tell it, um, you can turn them on in debug mode. If they're in debug mode, then they have a VNC where you can actually connect to the desktop and see what's going on in the test. 
Um, obviously, that's less efficient. So generally, what you do is you run them in non-debug mode on your big grid, and you run all your tests. And if one of your tests fails, then, well, using Docker, it's really easy to bring up your own grid. So you can just say Docker run Selenium slash hub, and then Docker run node Firefox debug. Connect your VNC server to it, and then run a test on that grid, and you will see um, you'll be able to see what's going on and debug your test. But in general, you don't need to run the debug ones because as long as the test pass, it's more efficient to not run the debug ones. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so when you do run a node, you have to tell it <clears throat> where the hub is. Uh, you can do it completely integrated. If you run everything inside a single Docker container, then the hub and the node will just find each other. But if you're running on multiple machines, which you probably will if you want to run a big grid, then you have to define it. So there's a very strangely named hub port 4444 TCP address, which is the right here. And that's where you have to tell it the address of the hub. I'm not exactly sure why they picked such a strange name. But by default, the hub runs on port 4444. So. Uh, and then, of course, you have to tell what port it's on, and that's hub port 44444, TCP port. And uh, I happen to be running it on port 80 because due to various firewall issues, it makes it a lot easier uh, that I run my grid on port 80, and then I can connect to it uh, via normal HTTP. And internally, uh, the grid and the nodes are on the same network, but quite often, your tests are on a different network, so it's much easier to get through the firewall with that. Um, by default, when the, when the node registers to the hub, it will tell the hub where, what its IP address is, and the hub will be able to find it. However, when you're running on Docker, that IP address is actually internal to the Docker system you're running on. And what you do with Docker is you can tell Docker to route a port from the Docker host to the internal um, VM, or not actually a VM, the Docker container, but you also have to tell the the Selenium grid that instead of trying to connect to the IP address that the node tells it to connect to, it actually has to connect back to the Docker uh, container. So that's, you define the remote host here. Oh, whoops. Uh, yeah. So the remote host, you tell it, in this case, yeah, these are great machine names, but CLRV6087.64 is the Docker host. And then the port is actually dynamic. So if you look at this, this is actually running eight different nodes in a for loop in Unix. Um, and so dynamically, it's routing. The minus P directive tells Docker where what port to route from the Docker host to the internal container. So the Selenium grid nodes, by default, listen on port 5555. Uh, if I'm running eight different containers, I can't map them all from 5555 because they all need a unique port. So I map it from 555 $i. And at the beginning, it says 4i is 1 to 8. So $i is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then I tell the remote host that that's the port that this one is listening on. So then when the when the node connects to the hub, it says, OK, when you want to talk back to me, go to this host on this port. And that's the Docker host with the port that's being routed to this node. And then the connectivity works. Um, it's a little bit easier to see what's going on here. So you see, I don't know if you guys are familiar with really old-fashioned Unix commands <laughs> like this. but. Uh, for i and 1 to 8, so that just says iterate i from 1 to 8, and then do, and then here's the actual Docker command. So Docker run says run a, um, download a image and run it. Yeah. Minus d says run it as a daemon. Yeah. And then minus e allows you to define the environment variables. So here you can see where the um, hub TCP address is being defined, and the hub port, those are of course static, yeah. and then the remote host callback and the port mapping. And here you can see here's a grid console with a whole bunch of Docker nodes. 
Now, what Docker, another thing that using Docker gives you is that somebody else is maintaining it for you. So <laughs> instead of having to build your own images and all of that, basically um, updates are being pushed to the Docker Hub, and every day when you restart your hub, it will download a new version if one exists. Of course, you want to download that version and test it and make sure that you're not going to break all of your tests. But um, it's very nice to be able to take advantage of the open source community updating the work for you and it makes your life easier. So when a new version of Firefox comes out or a new version of Chrome, you'll get a new version of the Docker container and you don't have to do anything. So debug mode. Uh, as I was mentioning before, if you actually want to see what's going on with your uh, tests, you have to run them in debug. And that's, there's two differences. One is that you said you just add debug to the end. Yeah. The other thing is that um, the VNC server also needs a port that it's listening on. So you have to define another port uh, here. So port 5900 is what the VNC server is listening on. So I have to map for my eight different nodes that I'm launching here. I have to map a unique port to 5900 so that I can connect using the VNC server because the VNC server will connect to the Docker host and then the Docker host will route the traffic to the container. I will show you this in a minute. Um, and this is what that looks like. So here's a, uh, this is a remote desktop connection to a Linux system running um, XRDP. And then within that I've launched VNC and connected to a node, and here is a test running. So I wrote a test that connects to the uh, Selenium grid and checks its console, just as a simple way to make sure that the uh, grid is up and working. Okay, um, let's see. Yeah, we still got a bunch of time. Um, I can go into a demo. Does anybody have any questions first? No? Okay. So here I am connecting to a Unix system with remote desktop. And here, a bunch of hubs. Okay, so there's four um, Firefox debug instances running on this machine. Uh, let me actually, ah, so here you go. Here's four tests running in parallel in the debug mode. Nothing particularly exciting, but um, that's how it's running its tests. And then, so what I did is to, when you have lots and lots and lots and lots of VMs and Docker's that you want to bring up and down, it's not particularly interesting to sit there and log into them all manually. So I built something using Jenkins to automate all of that. Um, another problem I had is that if you're running a whole bunch of Docker containers, every time you kill them, they actually stay on the machine. So you have to delete them all. Um, so I have a few different jobs here. 
Um, basically, it uses, I have SSH keys on my Jenkins machine that allows me to run SSH commands on the um, Docker nodes. And essentially, I have, there's another project which uses Ansible. And when we get a VM from the, from the cloud provider, it's not Dockerized and it doesn't have our keys on it. So we have an Ansible script that installs all the users, sets up all the SSH keys, and sets up Docker. And then once we've done that, we can control everything from here. So if I want to kill all of my Docker nodes, oops, I got to log in, sorry. Obviously, with SSH, you want a bit of security in your Jenkins because you can run anything here. So I tell it which machine I want to do that on. This is 4639. And you will see all of those things disappear. So this is really simple. It's just using, uh, I believe I have one plugin installed on this Jenkins, which is the parameterized build plugin, and everything else is just plain vanilla Jenkins. So part of, so it's a parameterized build. You tell it what host you want to kill your jobs on. And then you run a shell script, uh, and you just log into this host and say, Docker kill everything that's running. Uh. So then the next thing I want to do is clean up all the old Docker things that are sitting there. Because the other thing is, obviously, when you're creating hundreds of VMs, you want to keep the disk space to a minimum so we don't really have a lot of extra room. Um, so we have to do this often or VMs stop working. So this just says Docker RM, and then it gets a list of all the Docker containers that are running. Is that a phone? Oh, OK. <laughs> So I'll run this as well. So here, now it's going to kill, clean up all the old containers. This is actually by far the slowest part of the whole thing. And then I can launch a whole bunch of containers again. So here. This is all a bit uh, alpha. I've built this all in the last couple months. So, the long-term goal is that actually all of this this Jenkins infrastructure, I can, when I'm building an Ansible script, where you can basically run the Ansible script and deploy the Jenkins infrastructure with everything you need to manage Docker just by running Ansible. So, I mean, Docker, for everything you run on Linux, you can run on Unix and not on. You don't have to run on Windows. Docker is a great solution. Um, sometimes you have to configure things directly, and then you can use Ansible. And you can also use Ansible to build your Docker images. So what we do is we write Ansible scripts that configure the PC, and then we do we put that in a Docker file. So then we run that. It does everything with Ansible. It creates the Docker. The only difference is Ansible does it dynamically. So when you do it with Ansible, you have to wait while it does it all, whereas Docker, everything is already done, so it's much faster. And then when anything changes, you can just rerun the scripts and it will rebuild the Docker image with the latest. We actually run every night. We build a Docker image out of everything for everyone in the company to test against. So here, I'm actually launching the Docker nodes. Um, do Docker run. You, one of the things you'll see here is time zone, Europe, Amsterdam. So. Uh, we had problems if you don't t set the right time zone, then your tests don't work. Um, by default, I think it comes up in America or in Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, I happen to be working in Amsterdam, so it says Amsterdam, but uh, of course that's just Central European time. And then here's the port and the uh, machine name and the remote host. So if I do this. Bang, it just checked if there was a new version and it launched four new nodes and it's quite quick. 
So now I can run VNC if I want to. Yeah, and if you look here, I can also run Docker. I can say Docker PS. Yeah, it's kind of like the Unix command. And oh, let me make this wider. You'll see here, it actually tells you what the port mappings are. Yeah, So 5900 is the port for the VNC server. So I'm mapping 559, 1, 2, 3, and 4 to that. So I can see here, 5591. And there it is. And then, of course, I can do the other ones. Now, it's a bit funny that I'm using XRDP and VNC, but the um, Docker project comes with VNC, and, um, well, I suggested that we support both, but so far it only does this, and it doesn't really matter as long as it works. Oops. So of course these are already running, I'm just connecting to them so I can see what's on there. So currently I'm stress testing the grid because there's actually some bugs in the grid. So in order to reproduce those, I just run tests constantly so I can figure out what the bugs are. Hopefully we'll see something here. Demo effect. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, sorry, it didn't take a whole 50 minutes, but that's about all there is to say about it. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Or <laughs> No? Yeah? What's that? It's not headless, it's, um, I mean, there is a user interface in there, it's just not being exposed, so. It's running exactly like it would normally, you just can't actually see it. Yeah, it's, sorry. <laughs> um, Windows, they are building a version of Docker for Windows, yeah, and, but it runs on Windows Server 2012, so anything you run on it will be running on Windows Server. Um, we are currently working on embedding Windows within Linux Docker so that you have a Docker image that you run and within that Docker image a Windows VM is running and that's running the actual browser. So this is only, for us because we want to test on Windows, this is only a short term solution. Um, I don't know if the Selenium Docker project, so there is, you can go here to GitHub. Selenium HQ Docker Selenium, and this is the maintained project from them, if this works. Uh, hang on. Oh, I've been disconnected from the network. Oh, it's not working. Hmm. So we are working on embedding Windows within Docker, and then we can run Internet Explorer and actually test on what people actually use. I don't know if there are legal issues to the Docker Selenium project doing that, because you can... Uh, uh, <laughs> this is my computer telling me I have to rest. It's in Dutch, too, but... <laughs> um, 
Ah, oh, there it is. It's very annoying. So here is the actual Docker Selenium project. This is what's being updated. And then they run this and they push it to the Docker registry. So you can come in here and see how anything is. Um, a Docker project is, I know, I'm lost on the internet again. Uh, well, now that thing just made my computer stop working. But you can get from Microsoft, you can get VM images for Windows for testing, and you're only allowed to use them for a certain amount of time. Um, so you can do it yourself completely legally. You can build the Docker images. There's no issue. I don't know if they, if they, if this open source project pushed those to the Docker hub, if there would be an issue, because that's certainly the best solution. For us, this is just an intermediate solution. But if you're happy to test with um, Unix, this works. You, but you can only do Chrome and Firefox. The, I mean, the idea is just that Docker is really easy to use. But you're absolutely right that that Linux isn't the ideal solution for testing. What is the main advantage of using a grid in Docker instead of just poor grid? Instead of what? Instead of just uh, poor Selenium grid without Docker. Um, yeah, it's just really easy to launch the nodes, yeah, and that they maintain it for you. So you just say Docker run and it downloads everything and runs it for you. You don't have to figure out how to configure it or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, you can download the Selenium jar and then you can configure the JSON files and all of that, but that's all already done for you with the Docker node. And they automatically update it for you. So every time a new version comes out, you can update your whole grid without having to do anything. And it's also really easy to bring up another grid, yeah, if you want to bring up another grid for testing with, like I was saying, then you just say docker run selenium slash hub, docker run node firefox debug, connect to that hub, and then you can see what's going on. And the uh, second question is uh, to run the docker from Jenkins, uh, you just have, uh, have to have a, a this Docker on uh, Linux machine and uh, run command, and that's all. So the Docker run okay. command is just what you type into the, it's just the CLI for Docker, yeah? And Jenkins just, Jenkins is just running Unix shells, all right? So Jenkins has an option to run a Unix shell command, and I just put in that Unix shell command, the normal Docker interface. I just tell it SSH, so I say SSH, there's a, there's a parameter to the Jenkins job, yeah, the internet stopped working, so I can't show you this. I'm sorry. Um, I mean, I mean, uh, to start with Docker, uh, when I have a Linux server, when I have Jenkins, I just need to download package. Oh, Docker, to install Docker. Yeah, yeah, you just say yum install Docker, and there you go. So it's just fast uh, start with Docker. Yeah, so you use yum to install Docker, and then you might have to do some configuration on Docker, and or you just go to Amazon Web Services and you say, give me a Docker machine. So all the cloud providers, they have Docker for you, so you don't have to do anything. It's only if you're running it yourself. Thank you. No problem. Uh, hello. Uh, Alex, um, you use uh, Jenkins, uh, uh, like, uh, you have one Jenkins, like, uh, on your laptop, uh, which is, uh, like, a local host? That's actually, that actually wasn't on my laptop. Ah, that was actually ah, within okay. an, a On a VM. virtual machine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But do you use it to control other Jenkins uh, nodes, or it's uh, like uh, one um, like? Uh, so I I built my own special Jenkins on that VM that only I have access to because it can SSH to any of my Docker machines and run commands or run anything it wants. So it has root level access to all those machines, and I didn't want everybody to have access to that. So I created a version of Jenkins that's running on that VM, and then. The Jenkins user has the SSH keys installed, and all of the Docker VMs have that as a uh, authorized SSH key. So then Jenkins just says SSH to this host and run the Docker command. Uh, haven't you thought to uh, put uh, Jenkins um, like uh, configuration into Docker node? Uh, so you run uh, your um, um, how to say? So if you uh, put up all Jenkins configuration in Docker file, so you could instantly uh, have built fresh Jenkins with all your needed configuration. Yeah. Because um, the problem with the Jenkins is, is you have everything manually configured in the jobs 
Well, like I said, I have an Ansible script which builds all of that for me. Yeah, and then there's also there's something called .ci, which I don't know if people are familiar with, but it allows you to build Jenkins jobs as code. It doesn't have the easiest programming language, but essentially you write a script and you check it into the root of your GitHub, of your Git directory, and then Jenkins connects to that, it downloads it with Git, and then it reads this file, and then it can generate as many jobs as you want based on that. So using that, you can generate lots and lots of jobs with configuration. Uh, and can you give some um, links to this uh, tool? Yeah, um, just like I said, the internet is not working, <laughs> but if you search .ci, D-O-T-C-I, I can try it again. Ah, okay. It says it's not working, but it is, sorry. So here's the actual checkout, and then um, here the guy who wrote Jenkins thinks .ci is great, so he does a lot of prom promoting on it. D-O-T-C-I. So with what you were saying about the actual content, Docker, actually, Docker containers are usually stateless. Yeah, so you have... When you run the container, you actually, it doesn't have any state to it, but you can have a, um, you can connect the container to part of your file system and you can have a stateful part of your file system. You look really familiar. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> um, and so what you can do is you can run Jenkins as a Docker container, that's really easy, but the actual content of your Jenkins jobs needs to be in a separate container with state. Yeah. So you'll see that if you look at Docker stuff, you'll always see that you have a separate thing for maintaining the state, but the actual Docker containers have no state. Okay. I think uh, we got Yvonne. five minutes, yeah. Uh, questions about uh, Docker Hub. Uh, can we use Docker Hub with the uh, same Vagrant package? Not Docker package, but Vagrant package. Sorry, I don't understand. Okay, we have nice tool. Vagrant is the same like Docker, but Docker we ha uh, have uh, one solution like Docker Hub. We can configure it a lot of uh, our virtual machine in Docker's. Okay. But if I have same uh, amount of Vagrant virtual machines, can I use Vagrant with Docker's? Do you have this experience or something? I, I'm sorry, that? I don't really understand okay. the question. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> To upgrade Docker, you mean? Yeah, I mean, I have a what I call my continuous delivery for continuous delivery environment, which every time a new version of Docker comes out, then I upgrade to that and I make sure it works. Every time a new version of the Docker containers comes out, I upgrade to that and make sure it works. Because obviously auto-upgrade is great, but if somebody pushes a bug out there, you don't want your entire infrastructure to collapse. Thank you, Oren, for the translation. <laughs> okay, we got five minutes. Anybody else? Okay, thanks guys.